Hello everyone, in uh, today's video we're going to be answering a question that a few people have had about selecting the appropriate cruise altitude for a given cross-country flight. So when it comes to picking out cruise altitudes, there's a lot of different things you have to consider that basically make it so that there's never really one good answer. But uh, we're going to take a look at a couple of those different details today so that you can start thinking about it. Uh, the first thing that we need to think about when it comes to cruise altitude is the minimum en route altitude. So uh, if we're taking a look here at a nice little sectional chart, you'll notice that there are these little numbers. So you get, have a big number and you have a little number directly next to it. This refers to the minimum altitude to safely clear the terrain. Now, in uh, the United States, at least, it's set up in such a way that you have to always be at least 800 feet above the ground if there are people and 500 feet above the ground if there are not people, which means that basically, if you're trying to figure out how tall everything is around you, you can just either look at the mountains or take a look at these blue numbers. Now, obviously, you know, where I live, you know, the, you've got some pretty tall stuff, but nothing really excessive. Uh, when we go all the way out west, of course, uh, this you can see with the weather patterns, of course, this is the winter. So uh, when you get that, you tend to get quite a bit of variety as far as the uh, weather goes. We'll come over on this side of things where you have actual mountains as opposed to the lazy mountains that I have on my side. And you can see that our minimum on route altitudes get a little bit taller. As you can see, this particular one was at 10,300 feet. So the first thing you need to do uh, when you're picking out your flight is you need to make sure that you get at least this high for any part of your journey. So again, if we were doing something, let's say we'll take off from uh, north of Grumman here, which is interesting that they don't feel. Let's see, we're going up here to Jackpot. We know that along this line, we need to be 7,500 feet here, 10,300 feet here, 9,400, 8,500. So if I were picking my cruise altitude automatically, I would immediately go, well, we at least need to be at 10,300 feet. So that's my first step. The second thing we need to consider about is the type of flying we're going to be doing. So if we are doing what they call visual flight rules, we need to make sure that we are traveling odd thousands if we're heading towards the east and even thousands if we're heading towards the west. That would mean that let's say we have this minimum of 10,300, getting this up to our next even thousand plus of 500 would be 10,500 feet. So luckily for us, this is actually a very simple route and it just means we need to be at 10,500 feet minimum. Now you're sitting there going, well, that's actually not too, too hard. So uh, why don't you go ahead and demonstrate a different one? Sure. Let's say we're going from PVD to POU. We're doing something like this. No, it seems my internet's little connection. Somebody's streaming somewhere in this house. You can see that along this line, now our minimum on route altitude will be 2,100 feet. Actually, if anything, it's probably going to be 2,300 feet because we are so darn close to this pretty hefty zone over here in Litchfield. So that would be our minimum. So again, because we'd be traveling from west, um, east to west, I should say, we need an even thousand. So we could do 2,500 feet without too much issue. We could also do 4,500 feet, 6,500 feet, and so on and so forth. So that's actually pretty straight. Straightforward. So you're saying, so that sounds pretty good. Uh, which one of those altitudes do we actually want to travel at? So um, now we have a new problem, and that's going to be weather. So right now, this is actually a good day to demonstrate this. If I hold my mouse over here, I notice that my weather condition indicates that I have overclass clouds at 1,000 feet. So here's the problem. If we're flying using visual flight rules, we need to be at least 500 feet below clouds at all times, which means that if I need to go to 2,300 feet or 2,500 feet, but my clouds are at 1,000 feet, I can't possibly take this flight because the clouds would literally get in my way. Now, some of you are familiar with the rules called VFR and top, where basically you fly over the clouds without actually going through a cloud. Technically, that is visual flight rules. However, it's super dangerous because you can't safely see the things you're supposed to be using as your references. So you have to kind of be mindful of that. That as well. So let's say, for example, my cloud level was 3,000 feet. Now we can do 3,000 feet because our minimum on route altitude would put us at 2,500 feet, giving us that 500 feet clearance. Uh, that's sketchy. So you'd have to think about that for the entire duration of the flight. Because remember, if you're flying visual flight rules, you can never actually travel through a cloud because you couldn't you'd be visually navigating. So let's say, for example, now, as you're going, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So obviously, um, it's not a good day to go flying for visual flight rules. How are we going to solve this problem? So then you can think about, well, um, let's go ahead and take a look at another scenario. What if I'm doing another IFR flight instead? So let's go flip over to IFR mode real quickly. Now you have a brand new minimum altitude, and it's actually indicated by a completely different color. And the reason we have a brand new minimum altitude is because now you need to be at an altitude that is so high enough that you can actually pick up radio signals from the appropriate stations you're going to be using for your flight. So in this particular case, if I want to fly this trip, again, I'll go via this one real quick. This is a Hartford VOR pretty easily. Um, we can see here along this line, I have a minimum altitude of 2,600 feet, but I noticed down here in Bridgeport, I have a minimum altitude of 4,200 feet. So my journey now, if I'm flying IFR rules, would have a minimum en route altitude of 6,000 
thousand feet because I need to do even thousands when I'm heading towards the west and I'm flying under IFR rules. So my 4,200 feet, I actually can't do because it's considered too low. And I can't do 4,000 feet, but I certainly could do 6,000 feet, which is gonna take a pretty substantial amount of time. Now here's where it gets interesting. If I did the opposite, and let's say I was trying to fly out here from Poughkeepsie all the way back to Providence, since I'm traveling in this direction, yes, my minimum on route altitude is now an odd thousand, which means 5,000 feet would be my minimum altitude to travel this particular journey. So, oh boy, that gets complicated. You also notice that there's individual altitudes for certain uh, jetways. So you always have to make sure that you're always hitting these minimum altitudes at all times. Otherwise, you can't safely rely on the radio signals that are being sent to you. So you can already see that that's starting to make things a little bit complicated as well. So now you're sitting there going, okay, okay. So this is uh, obviously weather has a major impact is obviously terrain has a major impact. Um, what, do you, what, do you, what do you suggest? What if it's a nice day outside? Well, if it's a nice day outside, things get complicated in a brand new way. Let's say our visibility for this flight perfectly unlimited. Let's say, you know, we have clouds that are, you know, 36,000 feet and we have all afternoon. Uh, how high should we go? So first of all, we know our minimum, so we can't go under our minimum ever. And we'd also know our maximum, which would be whatever the top of those clouds would be. So how do we pick our altitude now? Well, that's going to bring you into a slightly different topic, and it's going to bring you into what they call performance. Now, this is the POH from a Cessna 172N. Now, this aircraft uh, means a lot to me because it's the one I spent real time flying. So, man, when you want to talk about memorizing this section of the book, you're going to know it. In this particular chapter of a POH, it lists how long it takes you to climb as well as what your performance will be at certain altitudes. So what we need to do is if we're trying to spend the least amount of time in the air, we're trying to find the magical altitude altitude that'll give us our maximum speed for cruise as well as our minimum time wasted climbing. So now if you take a look at this chart real quick, I'll zoom in a little bit in case you can't see it very well, you'll notice if I'm at a pressure altitude of 4,000 feet, I can get 118 knots. But if I'm at a pressure altitude of um, 6,000 feet, I can get 120 or even 8,000 will get me 122 knots, which is very fast. So we are going, hey, this sounds good. We can now climb up to 8,000 feet and get ourselves an extra two knots of speed without burning any more fuel than lower altitude. Now you're saying, that's a great idea idea. Here's the problem now. 8,000 feet, let's see here, it's uh, 70 knot cruise speed. My rate of climb is 390 feet per minute. It takes 15 minutes to get to 8,000 feet. So my time savings here, because I'm going two knots faster, is completely wasted based on all this time it takes to actually get up. And remember, once you get up to that altitude, you have to come back down from that altitude as well. So you're sitting there going, well, why don't we use 6,000 feet? Well, that takes 10 minutes. And at 6,000 feet, you're only getting uh, two knots better than you got at 4,000 feet. So now you're sitting there going, oh, okay, okay, this, this, this math problem just got a little bit more extreme. Can you make a recommendation? Well, the general rule of thumb is you never want to climb more than 10% of your total cruise time. So if I'm climbing for, uh, let's say, do an entire hour is going to be the length of my flight. This particular flight, if we did it at uh, 120 knots, uh, this would take us an hour and 24 minutes. So 24 plus 60 is going to be 84. 84 times 0.1 is going to be 8.4 minutes. 8.4 minutes would be the maximum amount of time we want to spend climbing. Again, it's a 10% rule. 8.4 minutes would be 5,000 feet. But as you remember, we're traveling to the west, so we do the pick 6,000, which would take two more minutes to fly, or we cruise off at 4,000, which would also mean that we could spend more time at a slightly lower speed. Like I said, this gets complicated. If uh, you were to ask me, I would always pick the next uh, altitude under. That still makes sure that you don't go below your minimum en route altitude. Ah, I told you this gets tricky. So now let's say we do it and said we're going to do this anyway. So we're going to go ahead and pick 4,000 feet. So it's going to take us six minutes to get up there. And then once we get there, our top speed we can achieve at maximum RPM here is going to be 118 knots. That's actually pretty good. That also means on the way down, we can take advantage of the fact we're up there. Now you're sitting there going, okay, so that's a pretty good rule. I like that 10% rule. That, that's kind of nice. Um, so uh, what's the catch? Well, the catch is this thing called wind. So now in the real world, winds are tremendously, tremendously powerful. Now, if you're in the flight simulator and click clear weather all the time, you're not going to be experiencing nearly as nasty a wind. So if I hold my mouse over this right now, I can see my wind here at Poughkeepsie is a tree four zero at tree knots. Now, I want to go into a little bit more extreme detail here. So let's go over to the Aviation Weather Center. Again, this is the U.S. It's going to be a little different uh, for folks who are everywhere else. 
Let's go over here. Uh, turbulence, winds, and temps is the one I always like to use. Let's go ahead and zoom in where we are right now. Let's see here. In the middle of Connecticut, we have a wind of uh, 1.8 knots at 58. I'll get a little bit of altitude, and we have 61 knot wind. 61 knots coming out of this direction at an altitude of 6,000 feet, which means if this aircraft is 122 knots going this way, I've got 60 knots pushing the airplane backwards, meaning my total speed, if I'm at 6,000 feet, would be 60 knots over the ground, meaning this flight would now take us twice as long as if there was no wind. So you can imagine that's not so good if we're traveling from east to west. However, if you're traveling from west to east, this is a completely different problem because now that 60 knot winds is added to our speed. So now you're sitting there going, hey, hey, wait a minute. If I can get 61 knots point pushing my 120, I can now achieve 180 knots, which is awesomely, awesomely fast for a Cessna. I've actually been in experiences like this, which means that if I climb my aircraft up to that extra nasty wind, I can now get a super duper ultra boost that'll push me all the way into my destination faster than ever. And that is another great way to take advantage of the wind. In general, the high, more likely you are to travel to the west, the lower the altitude you're going to have to pick. The more likely you're to travel to the east, the higher altitude you're going to pick. Because in general, at least in the United States, wind comes out of the west to the east, which means I want it to push me this way and I have, it's going to fight against it going back that way. So you can already see that, oh, that's another consideration I have to think of. So if I gain another 1,000 feet, I get 20 free knots. That's a lot cheaper, and it's actually worth the extra two minutes of climb time that we saw a little bit earlier here. So that's another consideration that you can consider. Uh, you know, it's a considerable consideration that you can consider. <laughs> you know exactly what I mean. So that's already going to be some things that we're going to have to think about as far as picking that altitude. And again, you have to know what those winds are before you try to climb into them. Because if you're climbing against them, it's going to be a very long flight. And here's another thing you might have missed. Did you notice the wind was coming out of 210? If we try to fly out of 210, that means the wind isn't actually pushing us perfectly. It's pushing us this way. I'm trying to move my mouse. I don't know if you can see that okay. Which means now we have to take that into account when we do our navigational calculations. Ah, oh, this just got more complicated again. So um, what is an easy way that we can sit here and kind of calculate all this rather than having to stress out? Well, the reality is if you've ever been over to Sky Vector, it does it for you. All you have to do is come in here, dial in whatever your cruise speed is, which again, we'll assume it's the uh, 118 here, and then go ahead and dial in your cruise altitude. I think uh, when we predicted this, we said about 4,000 feet. So 40, enter. And what it will do is it will estimate how long this flight will take. It tells us uh, we're estimated to be one hour and 11 minutes. Let's go up to 6,000 feet. But remember, we're at 120 at 6,000, which gives us an hour and 21 minutes. So I'll go back. Did you see that difference? So 118.040 is an hour and 11 minutes. If I go up just 2,000 more feet, even though my cruise speed's higher, look at this. It's an hour and 21 minutes. Now, let's say I did something really stupid and I went up to 8,000 feet. Now it takes an hour and 24 minutes, even though my aircraft is physically moving through the air faster. I told you this gets tricky. Now let's pretend we're going to do this flight the other way around, though. Let's do KPOU to KPVD. Press enter there. Looks pretty good there. Totally different flight. Now at 8,000 feet, I have a 50-minute flight. If I do it at 6,000, whoops, make sure you type it in correctly, 120, it's a 51-minute flight. If I go down to 4,000, it's a 55-minute flight. So this is a case where the higher I travel, the faster my flight is going to be. So you can see, just like I said, when I'm traveling east, it's always nice to fly a little high. When I'm flying west, it's always fly, nice to travel a little bit low. And that's one of the great things about this tool is it lets you actually play with it so you can kind of tweak it. Now you're saying, well, wait a minute, I'm flying a G36 here. This thing's a little bit quicker. Okay, same thing. Let's say my cruise speed is at 210 knots and I want to do it at six, a flight level. Whoa, can't do 160. <laughs> That'd be a little bit higher. I'll do flight level 016 here, which is a little bit higher up here. So um, that's going to give me a 33-minute cruise, which is uh, not too bad. If I went up to uh, 018 here, let's see what happens. Uh, that's pretty good. It's about 33-minute cruise. But again, you're spending a good chunk of that time climbing. All right, so there's one more consideration we're going to have to think about here, and that's the fact that um, we're also going to have to think about things like ice. Now, generally, uh, ice is a pretty interesting problem in Microsoft Flight Simulator because it has a pretty, it's everywhere, and as long as it's cold outside, you're running into ice. In the real world, let me go flip on the icing conditions warning here. Uh, let's go ahead. Uh, we want some sigmets. We actually are interested in our forecast icing, and you can see there is a tremendous amount of really, really bad icing possibility pretty much all throughout this entire region. 
So this simply would mean that whenever we're traveling, we need to spend as little time in clouds as possible. So if you take a quick look at our little chart here, you can see we have some pretty serious overcast this entire region. So if we needed to travel from east to west, but we knew that our clouds were 10,000 feet thick and there's an icing warning, no matter what happens, we would make, have to make sure we get over or under that icing in order to prevent our aircraft from basically becoming a very strange snow sculpture and crashing into the ground. So that is yet another consideration. So if we put all those considerations together, you're going to get something that looks like this. You get something that looks kind of like this. The first thing you always want to ask yourself is, what is our minimum root altitude? Again, that's going to be the blue numbers. You're going to ask us what our cloud ceiling is. Remember, if the cloud ceiling is so close that you can't do the minimum on root altitude and your visual flight rules, bad news. You're either flying IFR or you're not flying that day. Uh, consider are the clouds icy. If the clouds are icy, that simply is going to tell you that if we try to go flying today, we're going to end up, again, like I said, a funky looking snow sculpture. Unless, of course, we have anti-icing technology, in which case, spend as little time in that cloud as possible. Next thing we want to think about is what altitude gets us the fastest cruising speed. Again, all you have to do is go back to your POH in order to determine what altitude. Every aircraft is unique. You can find these POHs online pretty effectively if you're looking for them. Our next thing you want to think about is how long is it going to take me to get to altitude? Remember, you don't want to spend more than 10% of your total flight time climbing. Otherwise, again, you're going to spend so much time climbing, you're never going to be able to take advantage of that, you know, two and a half knots increase in speed. It's just going to be a waste of your time. And then, of course, this one's really important is how do I beat the wind? So if the wind is very, very strong behind you, then you want to fly higher. If the wind is very, very strong in front of you, you want to fly basically as low as you safely can. Now, you're probably sitting there going, hey, you know, this is a pretty good video. Or could you tell me about airliners? Airliners gets a little trickier because an airliner, you're basically required to fly tremendously high in order to take advantage of the, you know, the jet engine's excellent performance. The problem with that, though, is uh, your altitude is going to have another massive impact on that as well. In which case, you're going to be clear of the clouds. You're not even going to have to worry about that aspect. You're going to be able to detect radio signals. You're not going to have to worry about that aspect. But you're going to have to be worrying about tremendously strong winds. And again, just to give you an idea of what that's going to look like, let me go pop this up real quick. Let me set the flight level to uh, tree 60, just uh, tree 40. And you can see that I have myself a 112 knot headwind if I were traveling from east to west. So, of course, I could say, well, what if I travel at flight level tree 00? zero? Oh, uh, well, let's see if that improves things a little bit. Yeah, that saves me 10 knots, which over an hour is a pretty significant amount of speed. Again, jets are a lot faster than propeller aircraft, so you're not going to be as at the mercy. All right, hopefully this video was helpful. I'll go put my little list up again one more time. And again, uh, like I said, the general rule is 10%, but make sure you clear of the clouds and make sure you're high enough above the ground that you're not going to crash in anything. Another thing that you want to remember is non-turbocharged uh, propeller aircraft do not have the same climbing capability as the ones that do, which means if you're in a Cessna 172 and your minimum on route altitude puts you at 11,000 feet, I can that's bad news. It's going to take a very, very long time to get there. As a matter of fact, if you want to look it up exactly, it would take us uh, 24 minutes to get there. So um, it also covers 32 nautical miles, which is staggering. By the way, the wind affects the distance you cover here. So kind of keep that in mind. And look at our climb speed, 250 feet per minute. Oh boy, that's garbage. So again, these are things you're going to have to think about when you're trying to calculate it. But as like I said, as long as you're above the ground and as long as you're taking best advantage of the wind as well as your cruise speed, you shouldn't have too much difficulty. A little bit of science, a little bit of uh, kind of magic built in there, but it's a pretty neat process. And it's always one of those things where, like I said, in Sky Vector, you can quickly make a change and test it out. If I want to do 22, let's see what happens. Ha ha ha. That did not save any time at all. But again, you can see exactly what that does. Enjoy.